Take it away. So thank you everybody for joining. Obviously, this is a very uh, important uh, topic and, and conversation. What's, what's one of the challenging things about disaster planning is uh, there's all types of disasters you could potentially uh, have to plan for. And they could be as small as you have a single internet provider at your at one of your like at your location or one of your locations, and that uh, line um, is down, and you have no idea, uh, you know, the amount of time it's going to take to get that back up. Depending upon what the type of issue is, you know, it, it could be a couple hours to a couple days. I've had a location. Uh, in New York City, there was a manhole fire, and there was uh, fiber lines going to all kind of businesses that were melted. Um, and it was, it took about three weeks to a month to fix those lines. And luckily, we had a backup at that line at that location, uh, but the backup generally is not as good as your primary. Uh, so we we hobbled along, but but things uh, you know were were working. But without that backup. Uh, we, we, you know, it would have been a challenge to get a, a secondary line installed pretty quickly. Uh, so that's, you know, a, an example of, of one possible disaster to, uh, you know, dealing with, you know, say Hurricane Sandy and the floods that that happened in New York City, um, and and being flooded out of a location and not having access uh, to equipment that did not have power or internet. Um, and Juan, who is on our panel. Uh, from Puerto Rico Legal Services, he's going to talk about Hurricane Maria and, you know, the impact that he had. So planning for disasters could mean, uh, you know, something very small, but just the amount of time that the outage is, occurs uh, to uh, something more like a natural disaster, uh, like a hurricane, and having to, to deal with uh, that. So this is everyone on the panel. Um, Liz Keith, who's also on this panel, she's going to uh, talk from a perspective uh, from Pro Bono Net and some of the resources and uh, that they're able to provide, and um, not only from them, but uh, just other resources that are available in the event uh, that you have to run into it, uh, run into a disaster. If there are any questions, we are going to have uh, we're going to leave time at the end of this presentation. Uh, for for a question and answer, um, if you uh, don't want to forget your question, feel free to chat your question um, in the webinar, and we'll make sure to cover those questions at at the end. So, without uh, further ado, Juan, all yours. Come on. All right. Uh, Hi everyone, uh, my name is Juan Ocasio, I'm the IT Director of Puerto Rico Legal Services. And just to start, just a little bit of background of, uh, on us, we, also, we are a non-profit corporation like many of you are. Uh, we are an LSC funded program and we actually were established in 1966 and we currently are, are the largest civil legal aid provider in Puerto Rico. We, throughout the island, we have 15 branch offices and about 40 satellite offices. Uh, when we talk about satellite offices, are pretty much we have uh, make some agreements with some of the municipalities, and they have given us a space on their office buildings. And usually it's like one or two days a week or every other week kind of a thing. Uh, but since Maria, we actually have increased almost twofold what we used to have before. Uh, so right now we went from like seven, eight satellite offices to about 14 currently, and there's more coming down the pipeline. A lot of the uh, uh, municipalities, they want us to be in their location since we, we, we are not in every single town in Puerto Rico. And of course we have you know, special projects, and you can see those at the end of the slide. Uh, next. And of course, uh, this is all about Hurricane Maria and how we dealt with with her. Uh, September 20, uh, you can see, pretty much covered the whole island of Puerto Rico. Uh, we were, you know, a lot of devastation after the hurricane. 
like many other places, uh, like uh, happened with Harvey and the California wildfires, and what's going on right now with, with California too. So next. And of course, you know, you've probably seen a lot of these pictures before uh, in the news, but this is basically what happens after a major hurricane goes through an island. And a lot of our people, you know, they lost their houses, uh, they lost their belongings. So uh, it's, it was pretty hard for everybody in the island during that time. Uh, next. And, and of course, our buildings, our offices got also, um, uh, we had a lot of problems with our uh, offices, uh, mainly because we have a lot of water damage. Uh, we actually had one office where they actually have to shut down for about four months because uh, there was so much water damage that we have to pretty much go back in and rebuild it. Uh, but at least the main structure was, was okay. Uh, next. So see some of the challenges that we actually had after the, the event. Pretty much in all telecommunication services were almost non-existent. We were talking about we couldn't even call anybody. Uh, actually, there was only one radio station left in the island for a few days. Um, they actually, it was interesting because they actually had a, they kept their old analog system up. And that was the only thing that actually worked through the first few days in Puerto Rico. So most of the communication was done through, you know, whoever could call the station uh, was one way of actually communicating with everybody. Uh, one thing that we had, and that's because our emergency uh, line was hosted in all premise in our central office, when we didn't have electricity, we didn't have uh, uh, internet, uh, Therefore, our you know our emergency line was down for our endpoint use. That's usually what we they used to to find out what's going on uh, with with work. Uh, another thing is is that right after the following week after Maria, we had to do the payroll for everybody, and that was kind of a challenge mainly because again we depended of uh, internet to actually process the whole payroll. Uh, it was interesting, the, the, the day, I mean, the Monday after the hurricane, we actually came, you know, the, the executive staff came in to the central office of the headquarters, and we actually had to go into the parking lot because we didn't have any power to actually start working manually, making sure that we can run the, the, the payroll. Uh, afterwards, we actually was trying to find some uh, internet uh, signal and it, luckily we were close to our, one of the, our bank and they were actually, they act, they were actually offering uh, uh, free internet but because there were so many people using it, it was really challenging trying to, to get into the system. Uh, it was a, it, the, well, we were lucky though that our controller knew some people in the bank and the only way we actually were able to run the the payroll is because they allow us to go inside the bank and get into a terminal, and that's actually how we were able to do the payroll. Otherwise, we couldn't we couldn't do it. Uh, there was a lot of uh, gas and diesel shortages throughout the island. Uh, the first few days was almost hardly none. Uh, when they start actually uh, the diesel and the, and the gas was trying to starting to flow, uh, one of the you know one of the things is like you only can buy $10 worth of gas. So, uh, and you will stay online for about, you know, probably four, five, six hours just to get 10 to $20 worth of gas maximum. And for uh, some of our employees that left, that, that live far away from their uh, work, I mean, it was very challenging for them to actually be able to get to work because there was no, you know, there was no enough gas to go around. Uh, one of the things we noticed and is that because it was a, a high shortage of diesel, we have in, in our central office, we actually have a big power generator. Actually, uh, uh, generates 
uh, electricity for the whole building. And so the, there's a 120-gallon diesel tank. But the thing is, there is outside of our building. I mean, it's all uh, have link, uh, link fences and barbed wire. But because people were looking for diesel, especially to run their generators, uh, they were going around and actually, you know, uh, taking, uh, uh, you know, drilling holes in the tanks just to get the uh, diesel out. So the thing is, is that we needed to find uh, security for our building, and at that time we couldn't communicate with our uh, security uh, uh, contractor. Uh, so we actually literally had to go around and find a, a a company that had some security and literally verbally do it did a contract with them so we so we can actually uh, be able to to uh, to protect our generator uh, so it was there was there was a, a you know it's interesting because we couldn't you know we couldn't it was hard to, to find somebody but we did and uh, we were able to within a couple of days have some security a 24-hour security for our building until everything, you know, uh, uh, got better. Uh, also, another challenge, which was actually on myself, is that because there was not enough, uh, because it was very expensive to get the diesel in all the time, there was a shortage, I actually had to, when we finally got the electricity up, and I mean the, the data center up, we actually have to shut down every day the data center and in the morning come in and bring it up again. So that's uh, that was a little challenging there. Uh, also, uh, before Maria, we had a Hurricane Irma come through, and before that, we were actually working on migrating to Office 365. Uh, we actually delayed the uh, the migration due to Irma, and we set it up just before Maria, and we actually started migration, and we were done with, with it, but all of a sudden we had Maria on top of us, and we were not sure if most of our employees were able to actually get into the system. So that was kind of hard as part of the communicating with everybody. Uh, like I said before, we, we had a, a branch office that was closed for four months, so we actually have to relocate all the personnel to other offices while, while the uh, branch office was being rebuilt. And another thing is that there was no internet redundancy in branch offices. So we actually, what we had to do is we had some hotspot that we were able to get. And we were actually moving hotspots around when the offices were coming up uh, with the internet. So, but at the beginning, we were looking about, you know, a couple of months before we actually, you know, started doing that. Uh, next, please. Uh, so, I just wanted to, so you can see how, you know, what, how long it took to start recovering everything. Uh, by, by the 25th of September, five days later, we actually met at the headquarter building and started the payroll process. Uh, uh, the 26th, we actually were able to energize our power generator, but we didn't have any electricity yet. So that's why we have to uh, uh, shut down and bring up the uh, the generator every day. Uh, we had we actually have three internet providers coming into the central office. Only one survived, and we finally got that one up until October. By the by next. Uh, by the 3rd of October, uh, LSC was calling us because people wanted to donate to us, and our web page wasn't up. And the thing is, is our web page was hosted uh, on premise here at the, at the headquarters building. So what, we were already working on a new page. It wasn't 100% ready, but because people wanted to donate, and we haven't donated uh, links to it, we actually migrate, you know, the, to the new web page right away. And that came in, uh, actually that was a blessing because a lot of people actually started uh, donating into the, using that page. Um, uh, by the 5th of October, we actually 
we're able to get most of the branch office uh, managing attorneys coming into uh, into the central office or headquarters for a you know meeting to plan out what we're going to do next. Uh, interestingly, though, is that for some of them, I mean, on a regular regularly, the longest office from our headquarters is about between two to three hours, uh, depending on traffic, to get here. So some of them, they actually, you know, uh, rode, you know, I mean, uh, drove, you know, four, four hours just to get here to be able to start planning what we're going to do next. Uh, by 9 October, everybody was are starting to report to work. Uh, and by the 10th, the first branch office was energized, but did they have internet? Uh, actually, the first uh, offices that had internet was around mid-November. By February, we have 100% energized. By March, we have 100% with internet. <coughs> and by June, all utilities, you know, including internet, was pretty much stable. Until then, I mean, we had sporadic times where we actually the, the power we will go out or the internet will go out, uh, especially in a couple of uh, areas. Um, uh, but what we did, though, is that we, as the branch offices starting to come up with electricity, if they didn't have, uh, if our main provider wasn't up for Internet, we actually went in and, and set up a, a, uh, a hotspot in that office. One thing, though, is that uh, when we went ahead and, 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 and got those uh, hotspots, actually, we're kind of a hotspot router type. And uh, of course, that was, was was available for us. And we didn't realize that the that, they, that model of router wouldn't allow us to change part of the IP address. <coughs> so we actually end up uh, changing and modifying the DHCP on our servers in those branch offices because we didn't have like a, 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 a failover type a firewall. So we actually have to plug in directly into the network. So one thing is that we learned is that we, wanted, we needed to check better the specifications of that router and, how, what, and what we could actually change. Uh, next. So basically, you know, after after we had the meeting with all the managing attorneys, and we went back to work in about a couple of weeks after. And uh, so one of the things we did is that one of our attorneys got uh, trained in the Stafford Act, and he act she actually started training a lot of the uh, uh, volunteer attorneys and in-house attorneys. Uh, on, on this act so they can actually go out go out and help all the uh, all the uh, victims of the hurricane um, we actually uh, because a lot of the there was not ha there's not much happening at the branch offices because the our clients couldn't go in uh, a lot of them you know it was hard to get into the offices we actually went out to the communities and started uh, visiting communities and, and, and government offices to actually offer our services. One thing, though, is that because we have internet uh, and the uh, we needed to actually open cases and document everything according you know to LSE regulations. The central office became actually a printing office because we had to develop toolkits for all the branch offices so they can go out and open cases uh, because a lot of them, you know, a lot of the branch offices they have electricity or internet. Um, so uh, that was a, a big, big effort in, in the central office. We actually, we didn't have actually a toolkit or anything similar uh, to, to collect all the data. Uh, what happened later is that after all the data was, I mean, all the cases was open, we needed to go back and input all that data into our case management system. So that was a, a big uh, uh, challenge uh, for all the branch offices because a lot of them, they actually have to go come in to the branch, to, I mean, to the, to the central office to actually um, uh, submit all that data. Um, also, we were, uh, 
uh, one big effort was actually co collaborating with FEMA to make sure that we have some of our attorneys in, in the disaster recovery centers and help them, you know, uh, with all the, all the victims of the hurricane, uh, trying to get uh, aid. Uh, next, please. So now that we have gone through all that, uh, we, we needed to, to prepare for, you know, next event or next major hurricane or for the future, as a matter of fact. So um, we, we realized that we needed to revise our business continuity and disaster recovery plan. Uh, mainly because I think we, we, we were focused mostly uh -huh. in the disaster recovery on, from the IT standpoint, and we never went back and looked and how the business uh, or, the, or the business processes were going to continue during the disaster. So right now we in the process of revising the whole thing. Um, one thing that we also decided was that we needed to move to the cloud uh, faster than we were planning on. So starting with our web page, we definitely went to the uh, to the cloud on that one. Uh, we hosted off premises. Uh, thanks to a donation from Legal Server, uh, we actually migrating to Legal Server as, as I speak right now. We are uh, we going live on the 10th of December with Legal Server. We're in the process of training all our personnel and uh, doing the, the uh, uh, modifying and 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 configuring Legal Server to make sure we are ready for the, the 10th of December. We also, uh, we use the Dynamics GP for our financial system. That also is going, is going to be hosted <coughs> offline, I mean off, uh, off premises. And we're supposed to starting next month on that. And finally, uh, we also doing our telephone system. We're actually going with a VoIP provider and we move in the whole system to the cloud. We actually are about three branch offices already moved in with the system. One of the nice thing about the system is that we are going to be able to have a centralized uh, system for the whole corporation. Um, one thing is that we also working is is redundancy in branch offices. You know, one of the things that you know uh, it took a while to get uh, our main uh, internet provider to to get to, to have internet in our in all our uh, branch offices, so that took a while. And, and we with the uh, with the uh, uh, hotspots, we were able to actually move you know uh, and be, be able to get uh, all the offices to do some work, uh, but. And we realized that we have to come up with uh, somehow uh, make sure that, that every branch office has a failover system for Internet, especially now that we are moving everything to the cloud. Uh, we figure that, uh, and as a matter of fact, one of the things we plan to do is, is set up some uh, uh, hops around the island uh, Pretty much like north, south, east, west, where we can have um, uh, internet, uh, satellite, internet by satellite, because that way we, we have some power and we're getting some uh, power generators, small ones, to the to those uh, uh, branch offices. If we can have that, uh, then we at least we can have uh, internet and telephone system uh, with with uh, having that, that kind of a uh, uh, system there. Um, we also, we realized that one of the things that when we started to go out to the communities, we realized that we didn't have enough laptops. Um, so that was, that became a problem because only, we only, at that time, we only had one laptop per branch office. So only one lawyer, basically, one attorney could go out and do some work. Uh, uh, so... So right now we are in the process of. I mean, we, this was already uh, planning. To, we were already planning to do this anyway, but uh, we didn't do it. It wasn't 
timely enough to do, you know, when, when uh, Maria hit, we were in the process of actually trying to, to acquire all those laptops. So now, uh, now we, we're doing that. Uh, through a, uh, and, and by the way, we had some, uh, some uh, uh, offices in the States, uh, actually, we, they, were, they sent us additional laptops we actually used to, to deploy to our branch offices. Uh, so that was great uh, in that sense. But right now, we, the plan is to actually get a, a laptop for every attorney. Uh, through a uh, donation from uh, Friends of Legal Services, we were able to actually, and I'll show the picture uh, a little later, but we actually set up like what we call a solar power portable office. And the whole thing was to, so we can go out and, and, and give service to, to our clients and to the victims. And we don't have to depend on, uh, you know, having electricity all the time because this system actually, you can actually recharge the battery and charge all the laptops on a portable printer scanner that we actually got. Um, also, in, in communication with some of our, especially one, one of our NGOs that we work with, um, they actually uh, uh, were talking about and they were looking at, uh, this alternate communication system, which basically is is kind of a mesh, you know, uh, system, and it basically it's only for texting, and you can use your cell phone with it. But the thing is, you have enough around people can actually do uh, communicate with each other and jump from one to another because it's kind of a mesh system. So if you want to look at uh, more about this? Uh, we actually started to look at this maybe for for a future deployment uh, on another. Um, uh, disaster is uh, you can go to that website I put it there www.gotina.com and probably you can uh, you can learn more about it. Uh, next please. So this is actually what we end up buying. Uh, we actually getting one. We actually got one for each branch office. We're going to get a second one uh, uh, because uh, we were able to get some is that to relieve money from uh, LSE. And as you can see, uh, it's basically have a portable printer scanner. Uh, the one in the middle is the battery. It's just a 100 watt battery that can be recharged with the solar panel in the back. Um, and of course, this has less a, a Microsoft Surface. Uh, mainly we, we, we used that one. Uh, we actually got that one because uh, you can get eight to 10 hours of uh, battery on that. So. Uh, next. So we are now a year after, and we're still working with FEMA. We're still deploying attorneys to the FEMA DRCs, and now uh, we're becoming a CRC right now, Community Resource Center. Uh, we're still collaborating with uh, some some communities, uh, we're providing services with them, taking service fairs over there, and. And of course, we're educating uh, you know people on, on disaster. Uh, we actually working also with uh, we we are with, uh, some of, some of the working groups that we're working with is the Disaster Housing Recovery in Puerto Rico, which is National Low Income Housing Coalition, the Ayuda Legal PR, which is our statewide website, and actually and we our Pro Bono Inc, which is our sub grantee that work with us on actually uh, doing pro bono work. Uh, our executive director right now is a member of the LSE Disaster Task Force, and we just recently, last month, we received a, the disaster relief grant from LSC. And one of the things we're doing with it, and I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of programs that are using legal server are looking forward to this, uh, is the fact that we do an offline intake web and phone app. So, uh, and, and that should be, uh, we should be coming out on December uh, of, no, September of 2020, we should be able to be done with it. But what that's going to do is allow us to go out to the field and, you know, open cases and qualify clients without needing internet. Uh, and avoiding what happened to us uh, last, uh, I mean, uh, early this year, that we have to actually re-input 
all the cases, and we actually looking at about 3,000 cases that we actually took, uh, that a lot of them actually had to be inputted again after it was done by hand uh, with using the toolkit. Uh, of course, we're also getting money to do uh, the mobile technology, uh, which is basically what we're talking about is uh, getting those uh, additional uh, solar power uh, portable office, and we're also getting some uh, uh, satellite, uh, internet satellite antennas to be able to get some, you know, offices, some hubs for the, when a disaster strikes, we usually have got to set up a places around the island where everybody can report to and work out of those places. Uh, and of course, we doing we getting additional money to to really increase the the pro bono outreach efforts. Uh, we uh, during the Maria there were some there was a lot of uh, actually uh, uh, pro bono attorneys that did some work, but there was no a concentrated effort to actually manage the whole thing. So with this, we're trying to set up a, a sensory manageable. Uh, way to get attorneys to cooperate when a disaster strikes. Uh, next. So, so some of the lessons learned. Basically, you know, definitely, uh, we didn't have the business continuity plan wasn't current. Uh, we uh, didn't foresee uh, not having, you know, uh, internet uh, or no communications whatsoever. Um, like I said before, we we were concentrated in making sure that all the IT was able to survive, which which it did. You know, the only thing is that we didn't have uh, uh, internet, you know, providers to give us the whole thing, you know, to give the internet. But but the equipment survived, uh, and, and you know, so we were okay there. But we never thought about how do we going to give uh, a uh, service to a client when we didn't have no technology whatsoever. Uh, that wasn't really, you know, uh, never thought out, I think. Uh, so we're going back and revising all of that. Uh, one thing is is that we realize that now, more than ever, we need to be more mobile. We need to get more equipment, and we're doing that to our attorneys so they can go out and go to the communities and be able to, to do uh, work, and especially now that we're getting uh, the legal server offline app and web app, uh, we definitely you know, need to get the, that to them. Uh, but definitely we, we realized that we were not mobile enough after the hurricane. Um, definitely we need to provide uh, internet redundancy in the branch offices so they can actually do work, uh, especially when one of the internet providers go out. Uh, and and I, I put this trash bags over computer equipment is because I mean it's a very low tech, uh, but when after the whole hurricane we did not lose any equipment, any computer equipment, no laptops. We didn't have even though a couple of offices had a lot of water over the over the, uh, the equipment, especially here at the central office and and at the office where actually there was water all over the place. But the fact that before we left the office, everybody went out and put a trash can, the trash can over all the computer equipment that actually did work. Uh, and, and and of course, you know, you we have to you have to plan for the worst. Uh, right now, we we're thinking about is like the worst case right now in Puerto Rico is a is a it's an earthquake, and even though we haven't got you know. A long time, but that could happen. So right now, our business continuity plan and disaster recovery is taking that into consideration. Uh, next, so you know when when a hurricane hit for the first few months, you didn't have no green whatsoever. The green in the island was scarce. Uh, now we buy. Finally, we got some green back. Uh, I think uh, we're getting back, uh, trying to get back into the, the, the you know, back to the normal, uh, back to normal, I guess, uh, I will say. So 
anyway, so so hopefully, I mean, at least this year we didn't have any hurricanes. Hopefully, I think we have at least another couple of weeks in the hurricane season. Hopefully, we never didn't get hit again. But uh, hopefully, in the future, we will definitely prepare for it. Uh, next, and this. Uh, Thank you, Juan. That was all great uh, information. Liz, so you are up. Um, I think we're doing uh, pretty good on time, um, but you, you're. You're up. Just let me know when you'd like me to change the slide. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Michael and Sart and uh, I. Uh, Juan, I'm just so impressed and in awe at uh, the challenges that UN Services Legales uh, and the team faced in the wake of Hurricane Maria and the creative response uh, and relative speed that you were able to to have in bringing systems and services back online um, facing such widespread power and telecom issues and uh, also really enjoyed and appreciated your uh, emphasis on building more resources and looking ahead towards the future so um, just really impressive work all around. Um, so just for this next segment, uh, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a, of a different approach than, than Juan um, and talk about technology planning, not so much within an organization, but within a regional or state justice community as a whole. And uh, we'll draw on Pro Bono Net's experience in this space in direct experience in the wake of Superstorm Sandy and our work with uh, field partners in a number of regions uh, from 9-11 uh, and Hurricane Katrina onward. So uh, if we go to the next slide. Okay, uh, great. So um, it just for uh, people that aren't familiar with Pro Bono Net, we are a national nonprofit that focuses on using technology to increase access to legal self-advocacy tools for the public, to strengthen pro bono participation, and to facilitate collaboration on cross-cutting justice issues uh, within a region or nationally. And one of the initiatives that we've had an opportunity to be involved in since 2006 is the National Disaster Legal Aid Resource Center, which is now a collaboration of Lone Star Legal Aid, Pro Bono Net, LSC, NLADA, and the ABA Center for Pro Bono. Uh, and that effort is really led day to day by Sandra Brown at Lone Star Legal Aid and Jeannie Ortiz, a Disaster Response Legal Fellow here at PBN. And um, I'm going to first talk a little bit about uh, some of our kind of direct observations and learnings in this space after Sandy, and then talk about some of the the planning resources and kind of capacity re uh, building resources that are or will be available through Disaster Legal Aid in the near future. Uh, so if we go um, forward, I think we can go ahead uh, two slides. Great. So, um, so. I, I, I wanted to just start with reflecting on some of the learning uh, from our experience in Superstorm Sandy, and in particular, some feedback that was surfaced in a uh, report that we had the opportunity to do uh, about two and a half or three years out from Superstorm Sandy that reflected on uh, what worked well and where there were challenges in the legal community's response in New York to that event. And uh, I, I'll go through uh, uh, some findings that I think are particularly interesting when it comes to kind of the role of technology and again that are more about how technology can strengthen collaboration and service delivery among multiple groups working on a response effort uh, and uh, facilitate collaboration. So uh, as part of that, that sort of reflection on Sandy, we did a survey that of approximately 40 legal services advocates, law firm pro bono coordinators, and law school collaborators that uh, looked at which of the following tools and resources they engage with as part of their Sandy response efforts. And uh, in in uh, this, the sort of wake of Sandy, Law Help New York, the statewide legal aid website in New York played a critical role in getting legal information out to the public. Uh, the regional uh, pro bono site, pro, the NYC Pro Bono Center, also was used as the um, central access point to training and uh, mobilization resources for volunteer attorneys. 
Um, there also were specific networking mechanisms that were set up in the wake of that event that you can see here were heavily used and relied on. So calls that were organized by the City Justice Center that I believe happened bi-weekly for a period of time and a uh, Superstorm Sandy legal response listserv that was set up you know, within a matter of, of, of a day or two of the event and became the primary vehicle uh, through which a diverse group of advocates collaborated uh, uh, in you know, very close-knit ways for a year or more and, uh, and even uh, now on some lingering issues from that event. So on the next slide. Great. So uh, we also had the opportunity to ask programs not only what did they use, but what did they think were the most um, successful aspects of the response and where there were uh, challenges. And I'm going to focus here in particular on places where there's sort of an intersection with technology. Um, I think Superstorm Sandy, this was in, in uh, 2012, the fall of 2012, when Superstorm Sandy happened. And uh, you know that I think there were ways in which technology was very effective um, and ways in which the community uh, still struggled in, in maximizing that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, you know, in, in particular, I think we saw the, uh, the role of Law Help New York and the, the really for the first time in, in our experience, a really strong use of social media and um, digital marketing and digital outreach to get information out to the public in affected communities as uh, being uh, uh, an area where the legal community's response really shown um, uh, and was very impactful in its use of technology, as well as uh, uh, standing up tools like the listserv or a central clearinghouse of resources for advocates in facilitating collaboration across organizations and helping to bring together the subject matter expertise from a number of different groups and capturing that in one place that multiple organizations and multiple uh, volunteers, regardless of what program they were volunteering with, could have access to. Uh, where we saw and, and heard some of the, the, the uh, least successful aspects of the, the response were, um, you know, in, in some areas around the use of technology, uh, collaboration with, with government agencies, which was not, not a, a tech issue, but more about um, engagement with groups like uh, FEMA or some of the city or state agencies that were involved in the response. And then around volunteer management and volunteer recruitment. And uh, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this later on, but I think this is a place where the capacity of the community and the experience of the community nationally has, has grown uh, in thinking about how do you use technology to capture what is often a surge in interest among volunteers and assisting in a disaster, and then actually deploy and leverage that over the a, what can sometimes be a quite long period of time um, in which uh, in, in which those volunteers are actually needed. And uh, there were, uh, I, I think, ways in which uh, training volunteers and capturing the interest of volunteers in the wake of Sandy was very successful, and that was facilitated through the use of technology, but, uh, but actually then keeping those volunteers engaged and um, deploying them over a matter of months or years in some cases was, was harder. So on the next slide, we uh, also had the opportunity to, to ask groups, you know, if looking ahead, what would be the ideal elements of a sort of sustained regional disaster response uh, network that would encompass New York and New Jersey? And you'll notice that uh, many of these elements, many of what we heard, have intersections with technology. Uh, so people expressed interest in having a centralized database of New York attorneys that have expertise in disaster-related areas, um, uh, uh, disaster response plans that are uh, sort of channeled through different work streams and have different roles and uh, specific asks of different organizations, online and printable forms and documents, generic trainings that could be hosted online, kind of a permanent collection of disaster response resources that would be available in the wake of another event, um, a, a predefined volunteer management strategy. Again, uh, this was looking at this through the lens not of one particular organization, but how a, a, a network of advocates and organizations across the city and across northern New Jersey would, um, would work together on a volunteer recruitment and management strategy in the wake of an event. 
uh, and then um, kind of meetings or drills or exercises to sort of uh, uh, keep, keep the learnings fresh. And uh, on the next slide, as, as part of this report, uh, we had the opportunity to, to make some specific recommendations about what that would look like and where technology could be could be leveraged for that um, in terms of maintaining the listserv as an ongoing resource and archive for advocates that worked on this issue, um, identifying a cadre of subject matter experts that would help to uh, maintain and expand the resources that had been um, curated for advocates and housed on the, the regional um, uh, pro bono net site in New York, um, uh, ongoing sort of meetings and um, uh, events, convenings to help share best practices and refresh information as there may be turnover or uh, new experience sort of brought to bear on this. Um, continuing to leverage the resources that are available on disaster legal aid, and then kind of formalizing this idea of a, of a network um, that might span New York and New Jersey. So some of these learnings, well, on, on the next slide, um, some of these learnings were uh, were sort of resurfaced and um, uh, brought to bear in a new document that the New York City Bar Association and the Pro Bono and Legal Services Committee of New York took the lead on developing and that was released in June 2018 that I would really uh, encourage people to read. There's a link to it further down in the presentation. But it kind of took the experience of Superstorm Sandy and other rapid response efforts uh, that were led in the wake of uh, kind of large-scale um, policy changes in, in New York and kind of took those efforts and look at, looked at what would a rapid response protocol and framework for collaboration look like across various groups that have a stake uh, in a meaningful and just response to these kinds of events. And uh, it's a, a really um, thoughtful and, uh, uh, and I, I think, creative and forward-looking document, um, but it talks about the, the key elements of a, a rapid response being collaboration, uh, uh, leadership and clearly defined roles, and then marshalling of a wide variety of resources, including technology from across organizations. And on the next slide, one of the, the really interesting things that they did in developing this rapid response protocol was sort of define uh, five coordinator roles that would form the leadership team of a rapid response effort in kind of the, the New York City area. And it was envisioned that these wouldn't necessarily be one person, but one person who would kind of take the lead on, on convening and driving activities in each of these areas and helping to facilitate, facilitate collaboration among providers. And one of the roles that was envisioned was a te is a technology coordinator. And, uh, and the, that the role for that, that person or the entity that might be playing that role is spelled, on, spelled out on the right. But I, I love their articulation of this as uh, the technology coordinator and helping to provide kind of the central nervous system for uh, communication, uh, uh, volunteer management, and um, uh, uh, messaging to the, uh, the service provider, collaborators, and, and the public. So uh, if you are working on a disaster response plan with um, within your regional or state justice community and are thinking about how do we sort of carve out uh, roles for technologists and the role for uh, uh, a meaningful role for kind of technology and recognizing the need for coordination around technology, uh, this plan would be a great resource to take a look at and, and leverage. So on the next slide, um, I again wanted to highlight here sort of zooming out from Superstorm Sandy and generalizing Pro Bono Net's experience and some of the, the, the learning that our field partners have shared with us in their, um, their, their work in using technology to, to deploy a um, uh, more effective and uh, more efficient response or sort of build resilience for these events in the future. I wanted to highlight sort of an anatomy of some technology capacities that programs may want to take into consideration. Again, not necessarily for their individual uh, disaster response and disaster resilience plan for their organization, but for their community, justice community as a whole. So uh, some of the elements include a designated hotline and intake channels with contingency plans if the, the lead program or program that is envisioned as the host for that is directly impacted. 
centralized uh, resources and sign-up information for pro bono volunteers, ideally with the ability to screen, manage, and distribute volunteer capacity where it's needed most. Uh, I think sort of across many of the events that we've seen in the last few years and going back before that, um, you know, there, there are places, again, where, where that uh, remains challenging, I think, for, for very good good reasons, um, but where technology, smart applications of technology can really play a critical role. Um, uh, having identified ahead of time an authoritative source, centralized source with information for the public um, in the wake of a disaster, including Know Your Rights resources, a calendar of clinics, and referrals to direct service providers. There are uh, many good nationally relevant resources available on disaster legal aid, as well as that have been developed for statewide legal aid websites in regions that have been impacted by disasters. So if you need suggestions, if you're trying to kind of develop a, a core um, kind of content base in your community and are looking for suggestions about where to, to turn for models, please let me know. Um, uh, there's some really great examples out there. And, uh, if, and you'll want to consider translation needs in advance. We uh, also have seen in states that already had a live help initiative that that initiative often can play a critical information and referral finding role in the wake of a disaster. Uh, and there have been a couple of justice communities, including Louisiana and Texas, that actually started their live help initiatives in the wake of, uh, in the wake of Katrina and in the wake uh, in Louisiana and in the wake of Hurricane Rita um, in Texas. That actually was the impetus to stand up a live help project that then became a permanent part of their, their statewide uh, website ecosystem. And then plan in advance for, for social media and digital marketing strategies for the resources that uh, you're looking to make available through the public, which might include um, uh, dedicated URLs, taking people to specific pages of websites with Know Your Rights resources, the use of Google AdWords, and uh, social media. In, in the wake of the, the California wildfires last fall, I, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area and I'm part of the, a, a Bay Area legal services group that has been working on disaster response for several years. We noticed how quickly uh, uh, kind of um, for-profit legal services providers, many of which were sort of swooping in from out of state, how quickly they got their own Google AdWords campaign stood up and their own digital marketing campaign stood up, and that we were somewhat um, underprepared uh, uh, for that uh, in, in the Bay Area and to kind of compete with that in terms of the, the visibility that we were looking for for the, the uh, online resources for the public that we and referral resources and access to free legal assistance uh, tools that we wanted to make available. Uh, on the next slide, a, a few other elements, again, of a statewide or regional disaster plan, the kinds of listserv and networking tools that we heard were so effective in Sandy. Um, the, uh, the, I think it's worth considering whether there's a need for a centralized resource that might be password protected, if appropriate, with resources and tools that are um, specifically for practitioners that might include uh, your state or region's disaster legal services manual, training and webinar materials, and sample forms and pleadings. Um, increasingly, we're seeing programs use tools to facilitate remote and unbundled legal services or remote pro bono engagement in disaster response. And then uh, you know, really thinking through who within your community or who within your organization can uh, be a lead as sort of a social media strategist and digital marketing strategist, including somebody who is appointed um, not only to push information out, but to listen for what kinds of needs uh, might be might be um, popping up in the community or what kinds of informal grassroots response efforts might be happening that the legal services, the sort of formal legal services community should be aware of and, and get connected with. So um, I'll just wrap up here with some, um, on, on the next slide, uh, some resources that are available to support these kinds of planning efforts, uh, the resources that are available through the National Disaster Legal Aid Resource Center, again, which is a, a longtime collaboration of Lone Star, Pro Bono Net, LSC, NLADA, and the ABA. 
as of August 2018, the disaster, National Disaster Legal Aid also includes a new advocacy center with specialized resources and tools for practitioners working nationally in this space. So if you're not already a member of the advocacy center, I, I would encourage you to, to go there and get signed up, join the listserv, and take a look at some of the, the tools there. Next, next slide. Um, but there's a really wonderful set uh, of disaster planning resources and models that have been made available by other programs who have been willing to kind of share their hard-won expertise in this area that include uh, disaster checklists for legal services programs, a great example of a statewide uh, justice community technology plan out of, Louis out of Louisiana, and a nice example of an organizational plan or recommended plan that was produced by the State Bar of California along with other um, disaster planning resources. Uh, uh, some of which come from Just Tech. I also wanted to highlight here um, and, uh, an insight that, that uh, uh, the communications director at Lone Star Legal Aid shared with me recently was um, the importance of having staff who are in a, a kind of public-facing outreach role trained in crisis communications. And um, there have been some good crisis communication trainings that have been produced by uh, groups like 211 and Voices for Civil Justice just produced a, a training at the NLADA workshop on this topic as well. Uh, next slide. In terms of resources to uh, uh, online resources to support effective volunteer mobilization and um, uh, help to both get volunteers up to speed more quickly and keep them engaged. There are a, a number of kind of best-in-class disaster assistance manuals available on disaster legal aid. In the uh, ad new advocacy center, there's also a FEMA appeals brief bank and um, trainings that are organized by topic. LSC has produced a great set of sort of starter videos on disaster counseling issues. I've linked here to the New York Rapid Response Protocol that I touched on earlier, and also wanted to highlight a uh, startup kit that Legal Services of NYC developed in the wake of Sandy that uh, documents how they deployed a Salesforce-based uh, volunteer management system to uh, build their capacity to uh, uh, recruit and mobilize volunteers on behalf of Legal Services NYC in the wake of a in, in, in the event of a future disaster. But it also looks at how this system could be used to facilitate um, a, a kind of multi-program volunteer recruitment and mobilization strategy. So uh, even if you're not using Salesforce, some of the uh, design principles and uh, protocols that LSNYC documented in that startup kit I think are worth looking at um, to think about how you create specific roles and um, uh, think about creating uh, policies and other kinds of um, a, a framework to facilitate a kind of collaborative volunteer mobilization strategy. The next slide. Uh, I think I've touched on most of these resources available on disaster legal aid um, already. Uh, uh, but again, if you're not already plugged into the listserv or a member of the Advocacy Center, we would encourage you to, to join that um, to be able to access and take advantage of these resources. Next slide. Uh, Sandra Brown and, and Jeannie also have led the production of a national uh, roundtable series this year focusing on disaster response issues. And when we first started these, we thought there would be sort of small tables, intimate gatherings of maybe 10 or 20 advocates kind of coming together. What we found is some of these have drawn uh, you know, upwards of 100 attendees uh, from, uh, uh, from many different states and um, jurisdictions that have been impacted by disasters. And uh, the, the next topic and the one that we'll kind of close out the year on will be at the end of November focusing on disability rights issues in disaster legal response, one of the most uh, kind of requested topics that's come up in our conversations and uh, feedback from attendees in this series. And on the next slide, as we look ahead to this coming year, 
uh, we, through uh, an LSC-funded partnership with Lone Star Legal Aid, we will have the opportunity to expand some of the resources available on disaster legal aid, including additional roundtables on um, topics that we hope will include the effective use of technology and service delivery and being able to uh, learn more and have uh, deeper conversations about some of the kinds of creative, forward-looking, resilience-focused strategies that um, that people like Juan and groups like Servicios Legales are leading, and we'd welcome feedback on what topics would be helpful for the community to hear about uh, and, and discuss in those kinds of roundtables. We also will be developing a, 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 a toolkit to help support remote pro bono uh, mobilization on FEMA appeals issues leveraging an existing Law Help Interactive powered uh, FEMA appeals online interview. We uh, also will be developing new technology capacities and, uh, and points of integration with case management systems to support the cross-publishing of pro bono opportunities in need of uh, in, in, in disaster response contexts and being able to kind of amplify those regionally or nationally and then a series of uh, mobile-friendly user experience design and content updates. And uh, we're in the early stages of planning this and really welcome feedback from this community on how any of these or sort of other uh, national um, capacity can be helpful as you think about both responding to events that may be happening uh, in your regions or as you look ahead to planning and building more resilient strategies for the future. So. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Liz. That was a wealth of information. I hope others uh, found it helpful as well. Obviously, a lot to cover. I think you know one of the highlights here is you you have to you have to start the conversation internally if you have not already. I think uh, for for most, if not all, um, you know, a, a disaster is really about. Uh, when um, versus if, and the, the more um, planning and discussion that you could have beforehand, um, the better versus being in an actual disaster and, and trying to then figure out everything. Um, I think in, in Juan's case, it sounded like they had already, you know, started to implement some things, some things were midstream, um, so that sort of helped, but obviously then you know, going through additional disasters, it, it just is, is highlighted more about what needs to be done um, and, and building in some of that resiliency um, in the time of need because, you know, the clients do need um, the services, you know, potentially more than ever depending upon uh, what type of disaster it is. Uh, so really, you know, emphasize having these conversations. Uh, there's, you know, Liz provided, a, a, you know, great um, resources um, LSN tap. Um, I think you know. Hopefully, everyone on the, the call knows uh, that distribution list is is great. I mean, you just throw out a question. Um, there's and you know, in my book, there's there's no stupid questions. I think you know, throw it out there, um, and you'll get responses. Um, you know, sometimes fewer than than others, but depending upon the topic, uh, you you know, there's just a wealth of information and a uh, number of people out there just willing to, to help in any way that they can. So, you know, if you haven't already, you know, start to have those conversations internally um, and, and, and start planning on uh, what you could do. Think about uh, forming a committee. You know, I think, uh, you know, some people, uh, you know, in terms of a disaster, don't think, you know, the situation um, like that Juan brought up, you know, payroll, how does payroll get done? Um, you know, sometimes we're, we're focused on the communications piece and making sure the clients are getting service, but internally, uh, things still have to move. People need to get paid. Um, so, you know, having people on a committee, I think, helps an organization sort of think about all points um, that, that need to be thought about. Uh, with that said, I, I did want to leave some time for, for questions. Uh, Everyone is muted or was muted, but if you have a question, we'd be more than happy to uh, to hear and, and, and answer to the best of our ability. So um, if you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, these slides will be available. Uh, it sounds like we're not going to get rid of that. 
Uh, the slides should be available on our website. Um, we did add them into the handout section, but since they were added partly into the webinar, um, they may not appear for some people for download. Um, also, feel free to email us and we can send you the slides. Uh, Michael does have those and I also have those um, over at LSNTO. Thank you, sir. Any questions? We have, uh, uh, with regards to the mobile station that was um, set up, uh, what was kind of the cost around that? I'm back. I'm back. Excellent. Welcome question? back. Okay. I'm, uh, what's the question again? Um, it was, what was the cost to that kind of mobile office station that you put together? Yeah, it's around, uh, I think it was about 2800 that's not bad. Not bad at all. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, it, it was a the the ash that surface. By the by the way, it has one of the. It's one of the newer ones that have a built-in um, eSIM. So the 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 thing that we were thinking about that it was like we can actually get a few. Uh, we can actually um, uh, get the eSIM online, and we don't have to worry about getting a SIM card a SIM. For those laptops, you can actually, you know, trying to get those those sim uh, the, the the in the in the surface, you can actually uh, connect to a provider and get the sim uh, activated without actually going to a um, uh, a location. I mean, a, a provider uh, go uh, physically go and get the sim, uh, and that's that's the reason we go get those. And that's a little bit more expensive, but we're looking like down the line when that service is available, and we actually people can actually you know we get, can give permission to to actually get a SIM when they need it, so they can actually instead of carrying a a hotspot you know with them. Uh, the other thing that that is in that system is like uh, the um, there's a uh, Gold Zero battery which is about 100 watts that comes with the the, the panel so the whole thing I mean the, the the whole idea was is that while you're doing service you can actually get the battery being recharged and then and now you can go back and, and recharge your equipment and those are 100 watts uh, batteries and there's, there, those are lithium batteries by the way uh, and, and and I think the whole thing weights less than 30 pounds I mean the whole thing That's great. Um, Liz, the kind of social media marketing outreach that you talked about um, after a disaster, um, what what kind of like task items were on that or what things were people kind of doing on a daily basis? Because you talked kind of about internal and external there. And I know that that's very new to a lot of legal services organizations is some of them don't have anyone even managing social media currently. Great. That's a, a great question, Brian. Thanks. So, uh, and Law Help New York actually produced a guide, I believe it was in 2013 or 2014, on the use of social media in disaster response. And while the social media ecosystem and world has, you know, obviously evolved since then, um, it is, it, some of those the, just fundamental principles and practices might be um, helpful for people to take a look at. But the kind of building blocks of um, you know, what we've seen be effective are use of Twitter and Facebook and blogs for outreach in uh, Superstorm Sandy. Most of those were done in both English and Spanish and included information, a focus on information that was sort of time sensitive. So, that, you know, there's a clinic happening in Staten Island on Thursday or uh, there's a, a, an upcoming deadline for FEMA appeals, um, you know, sort of time sensitive, quick information that was uh, used and you know broadcast kind of repeatedly through social media and then amplified through the network of partner organizations that were involved in the disaster response uh, efforts. I know uh, I just presented at NLADA on a panel with uh, two with Sandra Brown and Claire Sayala, the director of communications from Lone Star Legal Aid, and they actually talked about doing Facebook Live events. Um, you know that had I think in one case 
several thousand people watching uh, essentially a Know Your Rights uh, uh, training that was done through through Facebook Live um, and also through social media, sort of uh, uh, listening and being responsive to social media. And uh, they were able to identify um, needs within local communities that um, turned into fairly high profile cases and actions that Lone Star was able to uh, to take action on. So you know both the, the sort of outreach and marketing piece as well as the listening and engagement and um, and thinking about ways social media, especially in a relatively chaotic situation, can help create um, uh, can help uh, establish bridges with uh, either clients who need assistance or other organizations that are working in an allied way um, in in that disaster response work. I definitely, I would, and I would just emphasize my, my comment earlier that also thinking about AdWords and, you know, some budget for paid digital marketing strategy, whether that's sponsored ads on Facebook or, uh, or even, you know, buying Google AdWords, because at least in, in you know, California, which is a very, Northern California, a very kind of competitive legal services landscape with a lot of for-profit players, we were, um, it was really noticeable, you know, CaliforniaFireLawyers.com was within days, like the top, I think, both maybe search result, but also definitely in kind of the paid AdWords listings. Uh, and you know, I think thinking in in um, uh, thinking about ways that that paid digital marketing can help the legal aid community um, uh, uh, compete with and maintain a commensurate presence with the kinds of free and low cost resources that it's making available. Right, and especially given that there's AdWord money available for free for nonprofits, if that's just set up in advance and people already know how to use it, um, much better situation. Excellent. I think that covers our questions. Thank you so much, uh, Michael Hernandez. I would definitely like to remind people we have the new request for proposal and uh, job board. So if you decide to hire somebody who's going to do social media in disasters, um, please send us an email. We will post that and share that widely. Additionally, this video should be up within a week on our YouTube channel. We're almost at a thousand subscribers there. So we appreciate having you as a subscriber. Uh, there are comment features there and we do monitor those. So if you have any questions about any of the resources that are there, um, we can get you additional information. Uh, thank you, Just Tech. Thank you, um, all the speakers that we had today. This was a great topic. Look forward to helping organizations prepare for disasters.